There's a lot of talk these days about climate change. Scientists, politicians, environmentalists, at sporting events, Hollywood actors, the United Nations, and even the general populace are all measuring in on this particular issue. So as we begin this evening, let me just share with you what I personally believe about climate change. I'll tell you up front from the beginning. First of all, I believe that climate change is real. Something is happening on planet Earth that we've never seen before. Massive floods, destructive mega earthquakes, as you've experienced here in Christchurch, powerful hurricanes, tornadoes, incredible droughts, and unbelievable rainstorms. Where I come, Fresno, it's customary for there to be approximately five inches of rain per year. And as I talked to my wife today, we've had six inches in the last two weeks, which is impressive. There have been floods all over California, whereas a year ago, everybody was praying for rain. Something is happening on planet Earth. So I believe that climate change is real. Secondly, I believe that the reasons that are being given for climate change do not tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I believe that there's more than meets the eye. Fourth, I believe that the solutions that are being proposed for climate change are good, but misguided. And number four, I believe that there is a hidden agenda behind all the talk about the problem of climate change and its solution. I am not a conspiracy theorist. But we're going to see this evening that there is an agenda behind all of this talk about climate change. Allow me as we begin to share with you what different entities and individuals are saying about this particular subject. A policy article appeared on March 15, 2012 which was written by about a dozen scientists. This appeared in the journal called Science. And um, I want to read what these scientists uh, said about climate change in this particular statement. Once again, the March 15, 2012 issue of Science, the journal Science. This is how it reads. Human societies must now change course and steer away from critical tipping points in the Earth system that might lead to rapid and irreversible change. This requires fundamental reorientation and restructuring of national and international institutions toward more effective earth system governance and planetary stewardship. So basically, the whole world has to be involved in the process, and there need to be new institutions with new structures. Now, the last part of the quotation is very significant. To be effective, a new set of institutions would have to be imbued with heavy-handed transnational enforcement powers. Did you catch the gist of that? Let me read it again. To be effective, 
a new set of institutions would have to be imbued with heavy-handed transnational enforcement powers. So you're talking about all of the nations getting together to have a heavy-handed enforcement capacity of issues relating to climate change. Powerful politicians have also measured in uh, in this discussion on climate change. For example, Governor Jerry Brown, the governor of the state of California, by the way, the sixth largest economy in the world, one state in the United States. He studied in Jesuit schools and was invited to the Vatican along with many other politicians, mayors, and governors of states of the United States for a summit on climate change. And at the end of the summit, he offered many accolades to Francis I for his moral leadership on the issue of climate change. Also, there's Mayor Bill de Blasio. He is the major mayor of New York City the financial center of the world. After the meeting, Mayor de Blasio said the following, Francis is the strongest moral voice in the world who is calling political leaders to action. So notice who's calling who to action. He said, Francis I is the strongest moral voice in the world and is calling political leaders to action. I was just watching the news on the internet today. Arnold Schwarzenegger, the former governor of the state of California, um, I don't know if it was today or maybe yesterday, visited the Vatican and uh, took a gift to Francis I. Francis I returned the favor and they actually recorded what Arnold Schwarzenegger said to the Pope. He said, thank you very much for the moral leadership that you have provided in resolving the issue of climate change. And then we have Ban Ki-moon, who um, at the time the, um, of the quotation that I'm going to read, September of 2015, was the Secretary General of the United Nations. On that date, September of 2015, Ban Ki-moon called on governments, and I want you to notice the terminology, to place the global common good above national interests and to adopt an ambitious universal climate change agreement at the United Nations Climate Summit in Paris in, to, in December of 2015. At the United Nations in September of uh, 2015, the United Nations, 193 of them, voted what is known as the 2030 Agenda. I would encourage you to go to the internet to read the 2030 Agenda. 2030 means 2030. It's the plans of the United Nations of what must take place in the world before the year 2030. It's a scary scenario. Basically, it's an agenda to control every phase of the lives of everyone on planet Earth. And this is not a conspiracy theory. This is documented in the literature from the United Nations on the 2030 Agenda. Let me just read you what Ban Ki-moon had to say about the 2030 Agenda. The new agenda is a promise by leaders to all people everywhere. It is a universal, integrative, and transformative vision for a better world. So the purpose of the 2030 Agenda is 
an integrated and transformative vision for a better world. He continues, what needs to happen in order for the 2030 agenda to be implemented? I quote, institutions will have to become fit for a grand new purpose. We must engage all actors as we did in shaping the agenda. We must include parliaments and local governments and work with cities and rural areas. We must rally businesses and entrepreneurs. We must involve civil society in defining and implementing policies and give the space to hold us to account. We must listen to scientists and academia. We will need to embrace a data revolution. Most important, we must seek to work now. When the Pope published his encyclical Laudato Si, which I'm going to mention a little bit later, President Obama remarked, I welcome His Holiness Pope Francis's encyclical and deeply admire the Pope's decision to make the case clearly and powerfully and with the full moral authority of his position for action on global climate change. And now notice this. Obama continued, not only climate change, we must also protect the world's poor who have done the least to contribute to this looming crisis and stand to lose the most if we fail to avert it. And then, of course, the Pope was going to visit the White House a few months later, and President Obama stated, I look forward to discussing these issues with Pope Francis when he visits the White House in September. That was September of 2015. And as we prepare for global climate negotiations in Paris this December, which would be December 2015, it is my hope that all world leaders and all God's children will reflect on Pope Francis's call to come together to care for our common home. Once again, that all world leaders and all God's children will reflect on Pope Francis's call to come together to care for our common home. You're starting to, divide, uh, you're starting to discern a common thread, thread in all of this climate change discussion. Let's talk for a few moments about Leonardo DiCaprio. Of course, he's an Academy Award winner, highly visible Hollywood actor, and of great influence upon the world's youth. On April 22, 2016, he gave an impassioned speech to the General Assembly of the United Nations just before 174 nations signed what is known as the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Perhaps you know that Leonardo DiCaprio is the UN messenger of peace with special focus on the issue of climate change. And he has done a documentary on the National Geographic Channel on the crisis of climate change. This is what he said to the United Nations. And then I'll read you what he said about an interview that he had with the Pope. This is part of his speech at the United Nations. A massive change, an upheaval is needed now. One that leads to a new collective consciousness, a new collective evolution of the human race. Inspired and enabled by a sense of urgency from all of you, he's speaking to the political leaders. And then he says this to the political leaders of the world, 193 nations represented there. You are the last best, best hope of earth. I thought it was Jesus' second coming, but anyway. And then he stated, 
we ask you to protect it, or we and all living things we cherish are history. DiCaprio met with the Pope on January 28, 2016. And of course, the subject of choice was climate change. Regarding the Pope, DiCaprio, strong practicing Roman Catholic, stated the following, speaking about the Pope's encyclical. I think he wrote this encyclical, which is one of the most important things in the climate change history, so to speak. Basically, spreading the gospel that we should care about the planet we live in. It's a sin to destroy our planet. He, that is the Pope, has been inspiring and revolutionary to come out and be outspoken about the issue of climate change. You're very well aware that in the last Olympics, the central theme of the inaugural program was what? Climate change. Of course, they were held in Brazil, where there's a tremendous crisis of climate change. The jungles of the Amazon are being mowed down at an alarming rate. Now, you've probably noticed that at every stage of the discussion and in every forum, forum the Roman Catholic papacy has been involved in spearheading and supporting the climate change agenda. Now, let me speak directly not about the connections of political leaders and scientific leaders and sports leaders regarding the climate change and their relationship with Rome, but also let me speak about what the papacy itself has been saying about climate change. On April 15, 2015, this was two months before the Pope published June 18, his encyclical, Laudato Si, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences released a statement, rather long statement, probably about eight to ten pages, which was titled, Climate Change and the Common Good. Do you remember that expression from Ban Ki-moon? Climate Change and the Common Good. A statement of the problem and the demand for transformative solutions. Not the desire or the wish, but the demand for transformative solutions. This was an eye-opening report. You can look it up on the internet. That's the wonders of Google. You can check out everything that I'm saying, plus much more. Don't go to the conspiracy sites. This is a uh, what this report had to say. They really had the purpose of scaring the human race into action. Climate change, I quote, is a global problem whose solution will depend on our stepping beyond national affiliations and coming together for the common good. It further stated as early as 2100, that's uh, how many years away? 83 years away. There will be a non-negligible probability of irreversible and catastrophic climate impacts that may last over thousands of years, raising the existential question of whether civilization as we know it can be extended beyond this century. So basically they're saying that if this isn't addressed, it's a question whether civilization will continue to exist beyond this century. Now it's interesting to notice that the document also says that this planet has not seen such an increase in temperature in tens of millions of years, which shows that the papacy has fully embraced the theory of evolution and we will be discussing that in our talk this evening. Now let me mention a few things about the Pope's encyclical 
It has many laudable things, many good objectives. The title of the encyclical is Laudato Si, which means praise be to you. The subtitle of the encyclical is On Care for Our Common Home. The Pope's encyclical was published two months after the declaration that I just read from. And the Pope in his encyclical made several suggestions of how we can address climate change, among which are a reduction of carbon gases, carpooling, planting trees, turning off unnecessary lights, restricting the use of air conditioning, recycling and boycotting certain products. And then he said, as well as giving the planet a Sunday rest. Interesting. Now, are these bad suggestions? No, these are good suggestions. We need to care for the planet. There's nothing wrong with carpooling and reducing carbon e emissions and turning off the lights when they need to be turned off. There's nothing wrong with recycling. All of these things would help the environment. But you're going to see that my issue is not so much with the solution that he proposes, but rather with the motivation for the solution. The Pope also called for international treaties that would pressure the affluent countries to help poorer ones adapt uh, to climate change and get off fossil fuels. Let me just read what he said in paragraph 53 of his encyclical. He recommended the establishment of a legal framework which can set clear boundaries and ensure the protection of ecosystems which has become indispensable. And in paragraph 5, he wrote, Every effort to protect and improve our world entails profound changes in lifestyles, models of production and consumption, that is an indirect reference to capitalism. And the established structures of power which today govern societies. Let me read that again. It entails profound changes. Lifestyles, models of production and consumption, and also a, cha a, a drastic change in the established structures of power which govern today's societies. In paragraph 169, he amplified a little bit what he means when he says uh, that we need to change established structures of power which govern societies today. This is how it reads. International climate negotiations cannot make significant progress due to positions taken by countries which place their national interests above the global common good. So the idea is to get rid of the distinctions between nations and all work for the global common good. Now on September 22, 2015, the Pope visited the White House. And we know what was discussed because I read a statement from President Obama where he said, we're going to discuss climate change and we're going to discuss how we can eliminate the problem of poverty. I don't know whether you watched the arrival of the Pope in Washington, D.C. There was pomp and circumstance and fanfare such, I have never, such as I have never seen before in the visit of a head of state to the United States. He was in the White House for about 45 minutes. And the topics of discussion were family, poverty, and climate change. Then the Pope was invited to give a speech before uh, the joint, a joint session of the Congress of the United States, where all the senators would be present and all of the members of the House of Representatives would be present. That was on September 24, 2015. 
You can read his entire speech. All you have to do is Google uh, Pope's speech before Congress of the United States, and you're going to be able to read the entire speech. The topics of the speech were saving the integrity of the family, addressing climate change, and poverty for the common good. And then the Pope was invited to give the inaugural speech at the 70th anniversary of the United Nations. There were 193 nations represented there. You can also read his speech. You can Google his speech given at the United Nations on September 28, 2015. The three issues that he addressed once again were the integrity of the family, poverty, and addressing the issue of climate change. Nothing wrong with the issues. The issue is what is the agenda behind the discussion of these issues. And then in Paris, from November 30 to December 12, 2015, the nations that attend the United Nations General Assembly met in Paris and they signed what is known as the Paris Agreement, which is a global pact for the reduction of carbon gases, among other things, and addressing the issue of climate change. This agreement became binding, it was signed in Paris, but it became binding on April 22, 2016, when 174 nations signed the agreement and many other nations said that they would be signing it in the near future. Let me read you what the Pope had to say about the Paris Agreement. Its implementation will require unanimous commitment and generous dedication by everyone. Pay special attention to the most vulnerable populations. Now you have climate change linked with the issue of poverty. And then he says, and carefully follow the road ahead and with an ever-growing sense of solidarity. Now, I decided that I would give you all of this information to set the stage for the most important part of our discussion. In the world today, there are two competing worldviews that are fighting to the death for the minds of human beings. Those two worldviews are creation and evolution. And what we're going to discuss now, you might not immediately see the connection with the issue of climate change, but as we go along, the connection will become very, very clear. The first thing that I would like to address is the biblical view, the biblical worldview. You know what a worldview is? It's what explains everything relating to the world. What is the biblical worldview? I'm going to share several biblical details. Number one, God made a perfect creation in six literal 24-hour days. Let's read Genesis 1.31 to Genesis 2 verse 1. We're going to read quite a bit of scripture now because there are two competing world views, the biblical and the evolutionary. It says there in Genesis 1.31 through Genesis 2 verse 1, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. Not good, very good. So, the evening and the morning were what? The sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were 
finished. In how many days did God finish the heavens and the earth? In six literal days. You say, how do you know they're literal? There are several evidences in Genesis. Each day had an evening and morning, which would be absurd to say it was the evening and the morning of the first million years. Literal days have evening and morning. Several times in the creation story, after God created something, it says, and it was so. In Psalm 33, it says, God spoke and it was done. Furthermore, we're going to notice in a few moments that the fourth commandment of God's holy law makes it very clear that each day was a literal day of 24 hours. So God made a perfect world, a sinless world, in six literal days. And then on the seventh day, God established a sign to remind His creatures that He was the Creator. Let's read about it. In Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, which day? Seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And what did he do? He what? Remember these words. He rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the... Seventh day. Somehow I think he wants us to know that it was the seventh. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. What does sanctified it mean? He made it holy. So which day did God bless? The seventh day. Which day did God make holy? The seventh day. Which day did God rest? The seventh day. Now notice why God blessed and made the day holy it says, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. God established a memorial of creation to remind us that we're supposed to care for creation because he is the creator. It's not ours. Are you with me? Now, I don't know if you were a perceptive uh, reader but did you notice that God ended his work twice? It says that he finished his work the sixth day. Didn't we read it? Yeah. And here it says he ended his work on the seventh day. Now, which is correct. Did he, did he end the sixth day or the seventh day? Let me explain it. I want you to imagine an artist who is painting a masterpiece. First thing that the artist does, he, he gets the, um, the canvas and he tightens it, he puts a frame around it, and he puts some base colors, and after the first day, he looks and he says, it's good. The second day, you know, he kind of paints the sky there and uh, adds a few colors, and he looks. After the second day, he says, it's good. The third day, he puts some shrubs and some trees and some flowers and the third day he ends his work and he looks and he says, oh, it's good. The fourth day, you know, eh, he puts uh, the sun in the sky and that takes a little while. So at the end of the fourth day, he looks and he says, it's good. On the fifth day, he puts some birds flying in the air. You know where I'm going with this, right? He puts some fish jumping out of the water and at the end of the day, he looks, he says, it's good. On the sixth day, he makes all of the land, uh, he paints all of the land animals, and he places a man and a woman in a beautiful garden. And at the end of the day, he looks and he says, It is very good. Did he end his work? He finished painting the portrait. What is missing? The signature, the signature that identifies who made it. God finished a living portrait that changes every instant in six days. On the seventh day, he put, signed, God. The seventh day is the reminder that God 
is the creator. Now some Christians say, well, but, you know, the Sabbath was for the Jews. Folks, at creation there were no Jews. There was Adam and Eve. The Sabbath is a creation institution. By the way, it's repeated in the fourth commandment. How many of you believe that the Ten Commandments, God would like people to keep the Ten Commandments? Do you think the Ten Commandments are still binding? Yes. Do you think we still should obey the commandment that says don't kill? Yes. Don't commit adultery? Should we still keep that one? Yes. Uh, don't steal? Yes. Is that a good one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, don't covet? Yes. Honor your pa father and mother? Yes. Uh, don't have any other gods before me? Yes. Don't worship idols? Is that a good thing? Um, uh, uh, respect the name of God oh, oh those are good commandments and Christians say oh no God wants us to keep those but it, when, when it comes to the Sabbath they say that particular commandment was for the Jews does that make sense you say what does this have to do with climate change one of the arguments is that people are abusing the environment why are they abuse, uh, abusing the environment because they've forgotten what? That God is the creator. That creation is not theirs. And why have they forgotten who the creator is? Because they've forgotten the sign of the creator. Fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. holy. Which day is holy? Sabbath. Sabbath day. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Which day is the Sabbath in the fourth commandment? The seventh. Whose day? It's the, it's the Sabbath of the Jews. No. It's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Do you know why it's called the Sabbath of the Lord your God? Because God was the one who rested on it first. Before he gave it to man. The fourth commandment continues. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. Notice that even servants and beasts were to be given a, a rest. The environment was to rest. Servants, workers were to rest. Even the beasts were to rest. That's important. On which day? Seventh. seventh day, thank you. On the seventh day. Now, why did God put in the fourth commandment that we're supposed to work six and we're supposed to rest on the seventh? Here comes the reason. Verse 11. For, that means because, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Is that the same Sabbath of creation? Yes. Does it say the Sabbath was blessed? Yes. Does it say the Sabbath was made holy? Yes. Does it say that God rested? Yes. Does it say that the Sabbath is seventh? Yes. So is it the same Sabbath? Yes. It's the same Sabbath in the fourth commandment. But then the sad thing is that a perfect world was marred because human beings chose to sin. Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they spread the virus to all of their descendants. You can find that in Genesis 3. And soon sin proliferated so quickly that the world became almost totally demoralized. And you have the first example in the Bible of drastic climate change the flood would you say the flood is uh, drastic climate change I would say so you see before the flood it had never rained the Bible tells us in Genesis 1 verse 2 that the earth was covered with water before creation week the whole planet was covered with water it also tells us in Genesis 1 verse 7 that God took part of the water on the second day and put it above the earth. In other words, the earth, had, the earth was like a giant greenhouse. Uniform climate. 
and put part of the water under the earth. And the purpose of putting the water under the earth, according to Genesis 2, 5, and 6, was that the earth had an automatic sprinkler system where at certain times a mist came up from the earth and watered the earth. In other words, the earth was watered not for, by rain, but by a mist that came from below the earth. God did not have to create water for the flood. God simply took the water above and brought it back down. And he took the water below and brought it back up and filled the earth with water as it had been before creation week. Now here's the big question. What was the cause of this drastic climate change? Well, it was because they were using too many fossil fuels. They had too many air conditioners running. They were not carpooling. What was the reason for this drastic climate change? Genesis 6, verses 5 through 7. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's something that is not even touched upon by the entities that I referred to at the beginning of our talk. Verses 11 and 12, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, with the exception of a very small remnant, Noah. And why Noah? Because Genesis 7 verse 1 says, this is the genealogy of Noah, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. He was different than society. What caused this drastic climate change? The sinfulness of the human race. But the Bible addresses many times the issue of climate change. You remember the days of Elijah? Was there drastic climate change in the days of Elijah? Yes, there was a three and a half year drought. Why was it? Because of the sinfulness of Israel. In fact, God had said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, He warned His people in the curses of the covenant. He says, if you disobey my voice, I will close the heavens so it doesn't rain. In fact, God gave some hope. He says, you know, if... I close the heavens so it doesn't rain, and my people pray and seek my face. But then there's a part that hardly anyone reads, and turn away from their wicked ways. I will hear them, and I will heal their land. The Bible has a lot to say about climate change, but the main reason behind climate change, these other factors might be factors involved, is the sinfulness of the human race. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Is it just possible that it's the sinfulness of the human race that is leading to this problem of climate change and all of the, natu the so-called natural disasters and that the primary reason is not all of these uh, solutions that are not really the solution, they're symptoms of the problem. Are you with me or not? Yes. So because of the sinfulness of humanity, God decided to give humanity a second chance. So he decided to send Jesus Christ to this world to redeem what was lost and to restore it to what it was at the beginning. But for that, Jesus had to do two things here. First of all, he had to live a perfect life. Let me ask you, how many of you can offer a perfect life to the law? How many of you can offer? The law says, obey me and live. How many of you can offer the law absolute perfection? Nobody raises their hand. Because if you did, that would be a lie. And you'd be sinning. There's none righteous. No, not one. The Bible says. So, 
The human race needed somebody to come and live in our place the life that the law expects us to live. And Jesus lived that perfect life. And if we receive Jesus, his life takes the place of ours. But then he also had to pay for our sins. And so Jesus took the sins of humanity upon himself and paid the penalty for our sins. If he received, we receive Jesus as our Savior, his death counts as if it were our death. That's what he came for. And now, here is the amazing thing. Jesus was on the cross of Calvary. By the way, you're aware that Jesus was the active agent in creation, right? It says in John 1 verse 3, all things were made by him. That's speaking about the word, Jesus. And without him, nothing was made that was made. The active agent in creation was Jesus. So Jesus is hanging on the cross. Which day of the week is this? Which day? Well, not which number? Six. Day number six. And when he's hanging on the cross, at the very end of his life, he says, it is finished. What did he mean when he said it is finished? He meant that perfect provision had been made to be restored to what existed originally. Perfect provision for redemption. And then here comes the interesting thing. Jesus finished his works of redemption the sixth day. And on the seventh day, he rested in the tomb. The Redeemer did what he had done at creation. Now, we're continuing with this biblical worldview. Because of sin, the Bible says that the world is going to get worse and worse, not better and better. Does evolution teach it's going to get better and better? Yeah. Uh -huh. The Bible tells us that just before the coming of Jesus, this earth will wax old. This world is old. This world is on steroids, if you please. In Isaiah 24, it says that the earth it waxes old. We just read that the world's going to become like the days of Noah. It's going to be like Sodom, according to Jesus, where the men of Sodom wanted to have homosexual relations with the angels. Jesus said in Matthew 24, there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and tumults everywhere. If you want to read what the world's going to be like, read Romans 1, 18 to 32. There's a catalog of sins that will characterize the world. And we're seeing them today. The family unit will fall apart. In Luke 21 verse 16, Jesus says, Parents will betray their children and children will betray their parents. The poor oppressed by their capitalist overlords will cry out for justice. That's in James 5, verses 1 through 8. And there will be ever-increasing calamities. Of course, seven last plagues will fall upon the earth, reduce the, the earth to an uninhabitable state. But there's hope. Because the Bible tells us that the hope of the church is not in the political leaders addressing climate change. The blessed hope, according to the Apostle Paul, is the glorious coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven to take his people to heaven. And according to the Bible, his people will be in heaven for a thousand years. And the earth will be without form and void. And there will be darkness upon the face of the deep. Jeremiah is the one who says that, Jeremiah 4, in verse 23. And then after the millennium, after the thousand years, God will recreate this world in six literal days. <coughs> and then he will rest on the seventh day. 
You say, now, Pastor Boer, wait a minute. Where are you getting that from? Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, God speaking, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass, notice it's speaking about new heavens and new earth, right? It shall come to pass that from one new moon or month to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Now you're probably saying, Pastor, well, how do you know that God is going to recreate the world in six days and then he's going to rest on the seventh? It's actually quite simple. Let me explain it. Can you have a seventh day unless you have the first six? No. no. So if we're going to worship before the Lord on the seventh day, it must mean that he recreated new heavens and new earth, the what? The first six. But the beauty of this, when God makes a new heavens and new earth, his people will be present and they will be eyewitnesses. You can imagine God saying, let there be light. Because the plagues and the second coming are going to destroy everything that exists at creation. Let there be light. And God's people will be, oh wow, the light came up. Let there be the firmament. Fresh air. Let there be trees and flowers. And it was so. Let the sun, moon, and stars occupy their places. Because the Bible says that at the second coming of Jesus, the powers that rule the heavens will be moved out of their places. So God has to put them in their places again to benefit the earth. The fifth day, God says, let the air be filled with birds and the waters be filled with fish. And it's so. And then God creates the land animals. The sixth day, then God says, folks, why don't we just take a break tomorrow and behold what I have made so you don't forget. Are you following me? Now listen carefully. The view of the secular world and the papacy is that things came into existence by evolution. In this case, we cannot trust the creation story. Neither the secular world nor the papacy believe that God created the world in six literal days as we are told in Genesis. Both the secular and the papacy believe in the evolutionary theory. Now I have a statement from John Paul II. Remember John Paul II? One of the most respected and loved popes in the history of the Roman Catholic Church until Francis I came along. John Paul II gave a speech before the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1996 and this is what he said. Today, and you can Google this, today almost half a century after the publication of the encyclical Humanae Generis, which was an encyclical by Pope Pius XII, in 1950, that's where the Roman Catholic Church began seriously shifting towards evolution. He's saying today, almost a half century after the publication of the encyclical, new knowledge has led to the recognition of the theory of evolution as more than a hypothesis. It is indeed remarkable that this theory has been progressively accepted by researchers following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge. The convergence, in other words, of all these uh, scientific scholars, different disciplines, the convergence, neither sought nor fabricated, of the results of work that was conducted independently is in itself a significant argument in favor of the theory. Francis I is even more bold. He said, 
the Big Bang, which today we hold to be the origin of the world, does not contradict the intervention of the Divine Creator, but rather requires it. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation because evolution requires the, cre the creation of beings that evolve. In other words, God created a blob of life and within it he placed the mechanism so that it could develop according to the principles of evolution. He continues saying, it gets, it gets worse. When we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything, but that is not so. He created human beings and let them develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one so that they would reach their fulfillment. What the Pope doesn't say is how cruel the process of evolution is. Let me read you what Frank Lewis Marsh, a scientist, had to say. Evolution presents a bloody, ruthless struggle for existence from the very beginning, where there is much waste of living substance and many false starts and blind alleys. Evolution teaches that there was, there was death long before sin. In fact, evolution does not believe that there was an Adam and Eve. So if there was no Adam and Eve, there was no literal fall into sin. So there's no need of a redeemer. You're not with me. Does evolution sound like a wise creator? Do you think God had established a mechanism that requires much death and struggle and animals killing animals and ceasing to exist until God gets it right? That's not the God that I serve. I serve an all-wise God. Is this the God who cares for the sparrow? Is this the God who dresses the lilies of the field with beauty? Is this the God who has the hairs of our head numbered? Furthermore, it's an attack on the omnipotence of God, the almighty power of God, because the idea that God had to create a mechanism where you have much death and savage cruelty over millions and billions of years what does that say about God's ability of speaking and getting things right from the start? What does it say about the love of God for his creatures and for his creation? The Bible presents a chain of events. Let me share that quickly. Adam and Eve were literal persons whom God created perfect and placed in the literal Garden of Eden, just like Genesis says. Adam and Eve were literally tempted by a literal serpent and had a literal fall into sin. Once the virus of sin came in, it infected every literal descendant of Adam and Eve. And death came in as a consequence of sin. And because of sin and death, humanity needs a Redeemer who will make it possible to bring the world back to its original perfect condition where there is no sin and no death. Let me read you what one Roman Catholic scientist has to say. Carl Schmitz Mormon. He's not a Mormon, he's a Catholic. His last name is Mormon. The notion of the traditional view of redemption as reconciliation and ransom from the consequences of Adam's fall is nonsense for anyone who knows about the evolutionary background to human existence in the modern world. And then this scholar states, 
The story of Genesis is not literal, and therefore salvation cannot mean returning to an original state, but must be conceived as perfecting through the process of evolution. So here's the question. How long will it take for creation to reach perfection? Millions of years? Billions? How many millions and billions of years do we have to wait for lambs and wild beasts to live together in harmony and for wars to cease? How much longer must creation cry out in pain for its deliverance? The evolutionary scenario certainly doesn't offer us much hope for an imminent coming of Jesus to quickly make all things new. See, your view of the beginning will impact your view of the end. What does the Roman Catholic Church believe about the end? Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever heard Francis I mention the second coming of Jesus? Not once. Do you know why? Let me read you what a reform, reformed is of the Presbyterian tradition. He wrote a very significant book, Ecclesiastical Megalomania, on page 187. He states, what the Roman Catholic Church state accomplished on a small scale during the Middle Ages is what it desires to achieve on a global scale in the coming millennium. He's writing in 1999. Let me ask you this. What did the papacy do during the period that it was dominant in Europe during the 1260 years. What it did was influence the secular powers of Europe to do what the church wanted. The idea was uniting what? Church and state. The church using the sword of the state. Could that perhaps be what the papacy is doing by speaking with the political leaders of the world about climate change? Get all of the political leaders in its pocket to ultimately accomplish what it wants them to accomplish. What is the papacy's ultimate goal in all this discussion on climate change? family values, helping the poor. You know, we can tell by the catchwords that the papacy uses. They constantly speak, and by the way, these expressions are 150 years old. The expressions that are being used by scientists, the United Nations, uh, the, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, these expressions are borrowed from Roman Catholic literature that goes all the way back 150 years. So we know who's borrowing from whom. They constantly use the expression, the common good. Basically, that means that individualism is an enemy to be dreaded. Second, solidarity. And that word means we are all in this together, so we must all unite in one ecumenical body and cooperate. Subsidiarity. That means that our personal interests are subsidiary to the common good. And frequently, they use the expression, the common destination of goods, which means that personal property is not personal, but belongs to all humanity according to need. Are you catching the picture? Yeah. Let me read you a statement from the Compendium of Catholic Social Doctrine. This is a document that's about this thick. I'm not kidding you. The Roman Catholic social doctrine has this many pages, over a thousand pages. And it's a fascinating read. This is what the compendium says in section 173. If it is true that everyone is born with the right to use the goods of the earth, it is likewise true that in order to ensure that this right is exercised in an equitable and orderly fashion, 
regulated interventions are necessary. Interventions that are the result of national and international agreements and a juridical order that adjudicates and specifies the exercise of this right. Let me read you the words of Benedict XVI. Very telling about the objectives of the papacy. Basically, the objective of the papacy is to influence all of the nations to address poverty, climate change in, in harmony with the Roman Catholic moral view. To then influence these political powers to do other things. And I'll be discussing one of those in a few moments. This is what Benedict XVI wrote in his encyclical Caritas in Veritate, paragraph 67. It means charity and truth. To manage the global economy, to revive economies hit by the crisis, because he's writing this when the economic downturn took, in, took place in 2008, to avoid any deterioration of the present crisis and the greater imbalances that would result, to bring about integral and timely disarmament, food security and peace, to guarantee the protection of the environment, and to regulate mi migration. Did you notice all the causes that he's mentioning? He says, for all this, there is an urgent need of a true world political authority. As my predecessor, Blessed John 23, indicated some years ago. Such an authority would need to be regulated by law. So he's saying there needs to be a world authority to deal with all these issues. He writes, such an authority would need to be regulated by law to observe consistently the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity to seek to establish the common good and to make a commitment to securing authentic, integral human development inspired by the values of charity and truth. Now here comes the scary part. Furthermore, such an authority would need to be universally recognized. Recognize what? Universally recognized. And to be vested with the effective power to ensure, ensure security for all, regard for justice, and respect for rights. Obviously, it would have to have the authority to ensure compliance with its decisions from all parties. And also with the coordinated measures adopted in various international forums. Who do you suppose would be this world authority? Let me read you what Pope Pius XI wrote in his encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, May 15, 1931. He wrote, There resides in us, us has a, or has a capital U to begin, he means the papacy, there resides in us the right and duty to pronounce with supreme authority upon social and economic matters. With supreme authority, is what he's saying. Now, let's bring this to a close. As I mentioned, the Pope has three main talking points. You know what his talking point, the talking points of, of the papacy used to be? Abortion gay marriage, euthanasia. Those were the topics of discussion during Benedict XVI. This Pope says nothing about it other than to say, who am I to judge? Why has he changed from these issues? These issues are terribly unpopular with the civil powers of the world. In order to be popular, he has to address the issues that the political leaders are interested in. Number one, poverty. And the argument that he uses is, by the way, he connects all of these causes with the need to observe Sunday as the day of rest. He says the poor are overworked by their capitalist overlords. And so their capitalist his overlords need to give the poor a day of rest. I'll bet you you can't guess which day that is. Sunday. 
on climate change. He says, the environment is overworked. The environment needs a day to rest. I'll bet you can't day which, which, guess what day that is. Sunday. He says the family, they're so stressed out, so busy during the week, they need a day to reconnect. I'll bet you you can't guess which day that is. Sunday. Listen, folks. According to the Bible, the day to give the poor and needy a rest is the Sabbath. We read it in the fourth commandment. Even the beasts are to give, be given a rest on the Sabbath. And servants are to be given a rest. Servants were not slaves. Servants were paid for their services. On climate change, what day did God give us to teach us that we're supposed to care for the environment? The Sabbath is the memorial of the Creator. What about the family? When did God create the family? On the sixth day. Which day were Adam and Eve supposed to connect? On the Sabbath with each other and with God. Listen to what the Pope had to say on August 12, 2015. He connects these three things with Sunday, whereas the Bible connects these three things with Sabbath. Are you starting to catch a picture here? The sign of an evolutionary worldview is Sunday. The sign of the creation model is the Sabbath. This is what he, what he wrote. The obsession with economic profit and technical efficiency puts the human rhythms of life at risk. Moments of rest, especially on Sunday, are sacred because in them we find God. The Sunday Eucharist spring brings to our celebrations every grace of Jesus Christ, His presence, His love, and His sacrifice. Is forming us into a community and his way of being with us. He says, Sunday does that. In another statement, this is actually in Laudato Si, paragraph 237, his encyclical. He says, on Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, nowhere does the Bible say it's a Jewish Sabbath, is meant to, number one, be a day that heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Which day did God give to heal relationships? Sabbath. The Sabbath. Then he says, rest opens our eyes to the larger picture and gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. And so, the day of rest, which is Sunday, for him, centered on the Eucharist, set, sheds its light on the whole week, and motivates us, Sunday motivates us to greater concern for nature and for the poor. Are you catching the picture? Why Sunday? This is my last point. Because the papacy considers Sunday the sign of its authority. Just like God considers the Sabbath the sign of His authority. One day was created by God. The other one was created by man for worship. Allow me to read you, in closing, some statements from Roman Catholics themselves. H. Canon Caferata. The Catechism simply explained. These are Roman Catholic authors. He writes about a word about Sunday. God said, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. This scholar is saying the, the Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. Why then do we keep Sunday holy instead of Saturday, he asks? The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants who say that they go by the Bible and the Bible only and that they do not believe anything that is not in the Bible, must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. 
The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible. So, without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. Last statement. It was the Holy Cat. This is uh, an individual by the name of uh, Father Enright. It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday to Sunday, the first day of the week. And it not only compelled all to keep Sunday, but urged all persons to labor on the seventh day under pain of anathema. Not only did it tell people to keep Sunday, it said, you better not keep the Sabbath. Then he indicts Protestants again. Protestants profess great reverence for the Bible. And yet by their solemn acts of keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the power of the Catholic Church. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the Catholic Church says, no, keep the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. That is the agenda. I read the last statement. This was written by Ellen G. White. This is what she writes. The restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. Hurricanes, climate change, hurricanes, storms, tempests, fire and flood, disasters by sea and land follow each other in quick succession. Now listen carefully. Science seeks to explain all these. But then she says, she writes, the signs thickening around us, telling us of the near approach of the Son of God, are attributed to any other than the true cause. Men cannot discern the sentinel angels restraining the four winds that they shall not blow until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, that means when God withdraws his spirit from the earth, she says, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. Excuse the bad English. You ain't seen nothing yet. And the great conflict and the great choice will be the Sabbath and the Creator or Sunday and the papacy and its evolutionary model. That will be the choice. And I pray to God that we will make the right choice. Not follow the traditions of men, the traditions of the church. But obey Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for having been with us this evening. Strengthen each person to make a personal, individual decision for your truth. Help them not to make decisions based on their church or their minister or what's popular. Help them to choose to obey every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.